Um, we do have a quorum, so we'll get started. Uh, we, we've got the agenda before us. If there are, aren't any changes, uh, and without objection, uh, that agenda would be approved. So it is, and we'll move forward. We also received in advance the uh, draft May 10th Management Committee minutes. Um, we do have a form, so we'll get started. Uh, we, we've got the agenda before us. If there aren't any changes, just without objection. Um, agenda would be Sorry, approved. apparently the iPad so is, is AI or something. We're doing the live stream. Uh, draft so management. Sorry, we've got the agenda before us. There aren't any changes. Just video. Uh, 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 is there any, anyone under 25? <laughs> okay, we just shoved it out the door. That's what we do. One where I got to come up with a, a paper clips and, and chewing gum um, solution. So anyway, well, we, okay, so before us we have the uh, draft May 10th Management Committee meeting minutes. We've all received them and had a chance to review them. Uh, are there any edits, changes, questions about those? Seeing none, then all those in favor to approve say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. And that passes unanimously. We uh, don't have any non-consent business uh, items or reports from standing committee. So we'll move into our information items. And we'll welcome up Mark Thompson, our director of Treasury. And we'll get our quarterly investment review report. So Mark, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Mark Thompson, director of Treasury. And yes, the first business item I have today is quarterly investment review. I have a short presentation. Um, this information was presented and discussed at the May 9th Investment Review Committee meeting. And now we're gonna give you a little uh, summary of that presentation. Uh, it was a good quarter for all of our portfolios. Uh, and I'll go over the details in a moment. Um, they're all compliant with state statutes and you know not a lot of change from last quarter, but I will uh, show you the numbers. Um, before I do, I'd like to just skip or uh, Next slide, please. We'll You're talk a little bit about the economy. Oh, my God. You've got the power today. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought I'd touch a little bit. Um, as you remember, in March, there was some, some turmoil in the banking sector. So I thought I'd say a few words about that first. Um, you know, it started with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank in California in mid-March. Um, and actually in March and April, we saw the second, third, and fourth largest failures ever. So I'm sure many of you might know that. Um, so the fear of more failures spread and the banks lost a, a ton of deposits and you can see in this chart The blue line shows what small banks lost in deposits and the red line shows the large banks So, so it gives you an idea um, Of kind of the, of the amount of dramatic drop we saw in, in March and in April um, for deposits and uh, You know large banks absorbed some of those deposits, but a lot of those deposits left the banking sector, went into money market funds, and into U.S. Treasuries. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment as it affects the council, but um, so about $300 million in, in deposits left the banking sector. Um, so the loss of deposit, you know, put a lot of funding pressure on, on banks, especially the smaller banks. Um, so the fear is that that will lead to tightening credit, um, which, you know, can affect consumers and small businesses. Um, and slow the economy more. So, so I just wanted to let you know that this uh, we talked about this committee. We talked a little bit about this at the last update I did in late March. Um, so the turmoil is still happening, although it's 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 gotten less. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that we're still watching it very closely because it certainly affects the CD CD investments we make make with a number of small local banks. Um, We've, we're still doing that program, but there's, there's been a little bit of a pause and hold back as we kind of watch this go through. We've had a couple CDs mature um, in April and May that we've just left for the moment, um, certainly intending to, to reinvest those as we kind of watch this situation evolve over the next few months. Really, my goal is to, to get back fully invested by the end of June is my plan right now. So soon to be back into it, but we're just kind of taking a little cautious approach and, and holding back on, on some of the investments for, the, for, the, for a month or two here. Um, next slide, as you know, the Fed's been raising interest rates for a little over a year now, 10 different hikes, and this just 
lays those out. Um, you can see back in 2022 at the start of this, and um, rates were pretty much zero, 0.25, and now as of May 3rd, they're at five and a quarter. This is the Fed's target rate. So we all know this, the rates have gone up dramatically. Um, the banking turmoil has certainly made the Fed's job a little harder because, like I mentioned, that's leading to tightening credit, which can also slow the economy. So the Fed is, at their May 3rd meeting, came out and said um, that they're likely to pause in June. So that's not for sure, but that's, that's what it looks like. Um, the Fed, you know, certainly the uh, inflation, and I'll show you more about that in a moment, but inflation and, and the labor market are tighter than the Fed would like. So that's, that's the two things they target, which typically means they would keep raising rates, but, but the banking turmoil is, is making them pause. Um, so I'm going to just quickly touch on inflation. This shows, this shows inflation through March. Um, you can see it's been coming down since it peaked at 9.1% back in June. Um, so that's good news. Um, and since this chart was made, April came out at 4.9%. So you can see in March on this chart shows one from 6% to 5%, which is great. Um, but I will, there's a little bit of a story behind that because this is measuring year to year. So the invasion of Ukraine, you know, caused inflation to spike back in March of last year. So that data is now falling off. So the big drop we're seeing is, is maybe not the whole picture. Um, but April did come in at 4.9, which was, which was good too. Um, next, this just gives you an idea of, of where the you know, yields are for U.S. Treasuries. Um, kind of shows you how they changed over the quarter. The dark blue line um, is the end of the first quarter, and the, the dotted line is the beginning or the end of the fourth quarter. So, the drop you see is how much rates decreased during during the quarter. You know, the short-term portfolio invests very, very short, so we're taking advantage of those nice high yields on the left side of the graph. Um, this one doesn't show the May 3rd hike, which, um, you know, pushed rates above 5% on the short end. Uh, the longer-term portfolio invests, you know, really in that three to seven-year areas where most of our holdings are. So, um, you know, obviously we've got a very inverted curve, so the longer longer-term rates are short or lower than the shorter term so that makes an interesting dynamic um nothing that, that you know this has been going on for a while now we've had this inverted curve um you know talk more about that when i show you the details of the portfolios but um you know our exposure to the stock market is is with this opeb trust we have at the state board and we're in an index a pool that's indexed to the s p 500 there so um you can see that the S&P 500 on the right side of the graph uh, really seesawed during the first quarter. Um, kind of a surprise that we ended up higher considering the banking turmoil and the Fed raising interest rates. And if you remember, we had some crypto meltdowns earlier in the year. But, um, you know, corporate earnings were generally strong, especially in technology. You know, we've got AI coming out causing the, the tech stocks to rally. Um, Communication sectors had a really good quarter. Uh, the financials, of course, and energy and health all had down quarters. Um, but we finished up 7, 7.48%. 7 so that was a good quarter, which you know certainly uh, benefits our OPEP trust. And again, I'll show you those in a moment. So moving to the short-term portfolio. Um, this is the portfolio we use for our short-term cash flow um, you know, investing available cash around the cash flow needs uh, around our big expenditures like debt service and payroll and things like that. Um, you know, it's very short, very conservative. Um, you can see it was 878 million at the end of the quarter, and it was 13% in T-bills, 50% in government agency discount notes, and 37% in uh, money market funds. And you can see really the change in allocation there is a continual decrease in T-bills and an increase in, in money market, which is the green. And really that was around the closer we, as we moved through the first quarter, the, the debt ceiling debate uh, was heating up and 
I started staying out of T-bills in case there was a default there. So we kind of a defensive move to, to make sure we had enough cash flow. Um, so that was the, really the change there. The uh, returns, we, we all performed again, of just slightly over our benchmark at 1.09%. Um, the average yield in the portfolio is uh, keeps increasing as it has the past few quarters. You can see it's at 477, um, capturing the member those short-term, high short-term rates. So our in interest income in this portfolio has been doing great. Um, with 10.8 million for the quarter versus um, 8.9 million for the fourth quarter, um, up dramatically from a year ago. So last year, just as an example, last first quarter last year, we were under half a million. Now we're at 10.8, so a big change. Short, uh, long-term portfolio. This is our longer-term reserves. Um, a little smaller portfolio, 452 million. You can see the allocation there. Not a lot of change uh, from the previous quarter, 59%. U.S. government agencies, 26% T-notes, treasury notes, and 11% municipal bonds, and 4% in CDs. Um, the return was slightly under the benchmark, but, but very close. Um, the average yield bumped up a little bit because you know this portfolio is, is longer term. It has less turnover, less maturities, but we were able to, to make some reinvestments um, during the first quarter, which helped um, boost up the yield a little bit because we're investing into uh, a higher yield in our environment. Because some of these securities were, you know, purchased a couple of years ago with, when rates were near zero. So it's a good good when we have maturities to reinvest. Um, the last portfolio is the OPEP Trust. Another good quarter, the second quarter in a row, positive numbers, which is a relief after. 2022, which was tough on us, but um, so this slide shows the, the statistics on the trust, and you can see that at the end of the first quarter it was 308 million. Um, I checked today, and it's up to 313, so it continues to to do well. Um, the first quarter return was 5.33 percent. Um, the average return, you know, historically on a longer term basis, you can see was we're still close to 8 percent for the last five years and over 10% for the last 10 years. So it's been a good performer and hopefully we've gotten through through the tough times of 22 and um, we don't go into a recession. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But we target 60% equity in this portfolio and 40% fixed income and cash. And you can see they were slightly over that at the end of the quarter. We do adjust it monthly. Um, but the market moves around every day, so we're never exactly on that number, but we try to try to keep it as close as we can to 60-40. Um, and you can see uh, we're right on our benchmark um, as far as performance goes. And that's it. I have any, for my comments, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Great, thank you, Mark. Are there any questions? Thank you for at least bringing up the, the, the debt ceiling limit discussion because I've been wondering, I mean, personally we're all watching it, but you yeah. know when you're in terms of a big organization, it's good to know that you're you know, trying to stay ahead or at least anticipate what could happen and safeguard as best we can. Um, and I just, yep. you know, none of us know, but let's hope this isn't a common thing every four years. We'll see. Right. No, because that, I, you don't get to, you know, it's been, what, 12 years since we did this before? And, yeah, and it starts to impact everything. It is impacting everything. So. Yeah, Madam Chair, we do, we do still have some T-bills, uh, but I haven't bought any for probably close to three months now. So just in case there isn't an agreement and I end to the discussions and a, a, a resolution, uh, we'll have less exposure to them. Yeah. Potential. Yeah. Default, so. Well, let's hope they strike a deal that we can all live with. Um, anything else on this? Um, thanks, Mark. Great, great. Um, you know, again, you're a, a strong leader and great steward of our investments. And, um, 
you know, again, even given the fact that we want to move to, you know, some of the smaller community banks that are um, owned, you know, from a diverse community, it, you know, it's good though we're just keeping an eye on everything so that hopefully we get past some of this stuff we can move. And you're right, we don't want to go into a recession either. So if you could just, like, call away House and Congress. <laughs> Tell them that. We'd really appreciate it. Really. So, again, thank you for everything. Yeah, if I may, Madam yes, Chair. Of course. Um, so during this kind of this pause, I call it a pause, just for a month or two here as we watch the banking turmoil, we're taking that opportunity to to get information from the banks. I know that the council wants feedback um, and this committee wants feedback, so we're, we're, we're getting a request out to the banks saying, okay, we're gonna pause here, we're, gonna, we're sending out a request and we're gonna give the banks a couple weeks to respond, um, getting us that information we need so that when Hopefully in June, we'll have all that feedback, we'll make new investment decisions, um, and we'll have feedback to give to the council. So this pause is maybe helping us get, because these banks don't want us to pull our deposits, right? right. So, so Some of them, we're are, saying, them are enticing right yeah, now to- So we're saying, know, we need this feedback. Yeah. Um, we're not pausing entirely because we, we don't have the feedback yet, but we're. Yeah. Taking this opportunity to to pull the deposits and say, well, not pull, they're maturing off some of them, and and say, okay, now tell us you're still financially stable. Tell us all you're doing to meet the goals of our program, and hopefully the next time I come back, we'll have that all complete and the program will be back filled up, assuming no more banking turmoil. But that's Mark, kind did of any of the banks that we bank with, especially the big banks, but I don't know why just the big banks. Did any of them reach out to us either through the banking turmoil or anything else at all? I, I know as the teeny tiny customer at US Bank that I am, they offered a forum where all their bigs were on talking about what was going on. And I'm like, oh, this, was, this is an important time because they're contacting little old me, but sure. anybody could be on that call. I thought it was very informative because mm -hmm. they were talking about their strategies and their leadership and how they're well capitalized, fifth largest bank, yada, yada, yada. But have, do, do our banks, come to us ever as a, I would say, fairly sizable um, customer? and Madam Chair, not really. I mean, we have gotten some emails saying they're they're doing okay and this is not what is happening, but we've never been invited to a forum like that or anything. I have been reaching out to all of our banks, especially the small banks, um, asking how their liquidity is and their funding is. And, you know, I, I realize they can't come out and say, oh yeah, we're gonna fail tomorrow, but. We haven't heard, of, we're not aware of any liquidity issues at any of our banks, but fortunately. Okay. Um, but I am in a dialogue with them as much as they can tell me. Um, but I haven't, they're not reaching out to me too often. Okay. It's more me, me reaching out to them. I'm sure they've got a lot going on, so. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else on this item, we can move on to the next item. Would that be okay with you? All right, so this is good news too, bond sale results. I'll turn it back to Mark for this one. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we had our bond sale. Um, this is mostly an annual event for us to cash flow our, our capital expenditures. So last week, on Tuesday, we sold three different bond issues um, under resolutions that council approved back in April. Uh, it was a very good sale. And I'll also mention before I give you the details that we were AAA again by both Moody's and Standard & Poor's. So that was a a great accomplishment, and we have stable outlooks for both of them also. Um, you know, being a AAA credit is, is very important to us for, for a number of reasons. You know, it attracts, attracts investors. We get more bids, more competitive bids, and, um, and we saw that this time. We had a, a great turnout for that, so, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. And, you know, it, it just ensures competitive pricing and uh, getting us the lowest interest rates we can. So. So I just give a shout out to everybody who helped. Um, Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah. So, what really tips you to AAA? What is like the? Oh, that's a, a deep question. Oh, okay. Madam I mean, Chair. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> no, the, the the rating agencies look at a, a number of things, right? They're looking at our our governance structure and um, continuity. They're looking at our finances, of course, our finances, and they're looking at the overall economy in the area, right? Because that's our tax base. So we're looking at um, employment levels, income levels, um, all sorts of things 
It's huge. It's huge area. Picture. Okay. Yeah. So they, and and I would just say when I was mayor, I got interviewed, and they were really checking political will too. So they watch the state, they watch our partners, they watch us because yep. when you so you're spending money, you better make sure you've got the political will to pay the bills. Yep. Yeah. They look at all of our funding sources, Madam Chair, and yeah, they look at how the state, state policies, uh, everything's inter intertwined yeah. and working together. Okay. Yep. So we have a team that you know we involve environmental services and transit and finance and have meetings with them, provide them a lot of information. They come back and ask questions, and we respond to those. And then we have conference calls. And in-depth process that takes a lot of people um, so that's why I give a shout out to you appreciate yeah, the help you. yeah yeah and it's, a, it's a big deal so congrats to everybody again I wish this was headlines in the newspapers and on the news tonight but it, it's a big deal because not everybody is staying triple A it would be nice not, if we got downgraded well there you go so hey yes, okay, yes. everybody we're still triple A huh? um, and there's a lot that have not gotten you know to triple A and, and wish they could and you know so um, again, I, I'm, I was thrilled, you know, going into this because, again, it's just a weird time. But that yeah, Madam Chair, it's, about, it's always a, yeah. a intense time, a nervous time, because we, we never know for sure what they're going to come back with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll continue. Um, so regarding the sale, I'll give, give you some statistics here. The... Um, you know, first of all, we sold three different issues, one for transit, one for wastewater, and one for parks. They were all within the parameters that were established in the resolutions um, quite easily. Uh, the timing of our bond set was really good market-wise. The interest rates had come down in the weeks before the sale. So we had done projections back in March when we started structuring these bonds of where we thought they would sell. And they came in uh, below those, which was great. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit, um, again, as I mentioned, we had really strong interest. Um, we had a good turnout from, from uh, as far as the number of bidders. So we sold 50.6 million 10-year transit bonds. We had eight bidders, which was great. Um, back in March, we were expecting 2.92%. Uh, the day before the sale, we adjusted our expectations down to 270, and they came uh, they sold to J.P. Morgan at a 264, um, and secondly, we sold 89.8 million of 20-year uh, general obligation wastewater revenue bonds. We had 10 bidders on that one. Um, we had expected back in March of 365. Uh, the day before, we adjusted our expectations down to 330, and they sold at a 336 to RBC. And then we sold 4.6 million of four-year Geo Park bonds. That one, we just had two bidders, so that was um, unusually low, but that was a very small, you know, $4 million short issue. Uh, there just wasn't as much demand for that, but it still beat our expectations as far as rate. Um, we projected these at 311 back in March. We adjusted down to 290, and they sold to Robert W. Barrett at 2.785. Um, so all these bonds will close in June. That's when we'll get, get the full proceeds. So it was a great sale. We're very happy with it. And any questions? Are there any questions? Oh, great work. Everybody again on the team that puts all of this together um, and works on it for a very long time. Um, our gratitude goes to all of you. Great job. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to the Division Department Diverse Spend Plan Policy and Update, and we've got Ashante Payne, Office of Equ uh, Equity and Equal Opportunity, and the Assistant Director with us to talk about it. So welcome back, Ashante. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Madam Chair, Council, and Committee members. <clears throat> Ashanti Payne, Assistant Director, Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity, and I'm here to talk about... Uh, division, department, diverse spin plans. Um, diverse spin plans is a component of our strategic plan for our uh, engagement and development unit. And um, we now have the resources, um, staff resources to carry this um, through and see it through um, implementation. 
So I wanted to bring this in, for, uh, in front of uh, this committee um, and, and ask for support for this initiative. So what is diverse spend plans? Um, it, it really will be a policy and procedure um, for that will require divisions to project their spend out at least one year um, and then break that spend down um, into categories. So it'll be organized around each of our procurement uh, methods. Um, for this item, there is a, a handout that, that's the outline of diverse spend plan, uh, what a diverse spend plan should look like. Um, so when I say the different procurement methods, micro purchases, um, sheltered market, as needed or on call services, construction, RFPs, master contracts. Um, and also, um, if, if for, in order to achieve true equity, um, the diversity <coughs> in plans need to be broken out and targets need to be identified um, based, disaggregated by race and gender. Um, so that will also be part of, uh, part of the process. Um, it really will allow for the council to be intentional in our planning. Um, it'll provide the space for the business units and divisions to be innovative um, and will create accountability and share responsibility because um, our outcomes in this uh, in our small business uh, contracting is not just an OEO and procurement responsibility, it is uh, agency responsibility and this will help us um, create that shared responsibility. Um, it'll make sure too that uh, departments and divisions engage with OEO and procurement early in the process, um, and it places OEO, OEO and procurement in a position to support um, and provide technical assistance to our divisions and departments. Um, it is also consistent, I will say, with our um, equity strategy and framework and the goals and objectives contained in there. Um, some of it will be measures um, for success that we will be monitoring to uh, see how we are doing our increase in the number and the capacity of MCUB and DBE firms, um, increase in the number of MCUB and DBE firms that bid or propose on council procurements, increase in the number of awarded prime contracts to MCUB and DBE businesses owned by people of color, Overall utilization of businesses owned uh, by black, indigenous, Hispanic, and Asian owned individuals, and increased involvement from departments and division leadership. So that's what we will be monitoring um, in terms of our success. Um, so what is the ask? Um, really that you support this uh, creation of this policy. Um, this is just some initial information. Um, we also are seeking input and feedback on, you know, we have a draft outline of, of the plan, but um, we've got some initial feedback and input, but we'll be seeking input and feedback along through this process. Uh, we will be presenting this information to the Equity Advisory Council, I'm sorry, Equity Advisory Committee um, of the council. Um, and um, so, uh, please, uh, any feedback and ideas, uh, uh, please have, please contact me or have uh, individuals contact me as well. Um, and then we will be bringing this back once we have the, the policy fully drafted and it's gone through the uh, policy review team and all the uh, steps that we'll be bringing this back uh, as a business item uh, to management committee and then ultimately for council approval. Um, timeline, uh, this proposed timeline, um, <coughs> finalized the spin plan, the, the policy uh, by June 15, um, disseminate the policy for review and send to the policy review team two to three weeks after initial, uh, after finalization, um, tentatively July 10th. Um, nothing really special, special about that date except for it is my birthday. Oh, um, wow. that makes it very special. <laughs> um, and then uh, seeking uh, approval, 
uh, at some point in August. Um, we will be um, reaching out to divisions and departments uh, to identify uh, equity champions who will assist in that coordination, um, serve as liaisons, um, but also we will be doing some training. Um, so they'll be, uh, we'll be partnering with procurement to do some training. Uh, procurement has a lot of the data that will be important to um, divisions to understand where their spend is um, and, uh, and such. So. Um, those liaisons will be um, critical to that as well. And then um, ultimately the spend plans will be approved by the division directors or general manager. Um, again, that's to you know, create that accountability where we believe it should be at the division and business unit level. And then they'll be submitted uh, to the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity. Um, I should note as well that um, there are some divisions and departments that don't have significant um, spin, so it doesn't make sense for them to break it out by micro person, all those different things because they don't have it. Um, we will not exclude them from this process. Um, they will just be required to meet with um, the assistant director and our uh, enterprise equity uh, senior manager uh, once uh, at the uh, Q4, Q1 to plan out and, and develop strategies um, to, increase, to increase their spend um, in the areas that they do have spend. Uh, primarily P cards and other uh, significant purchases. And with that, um, I can uh, entertain any questions that council members have. Thank you, Council Member Barber. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I appreciate looking at each division differently because they are different. My question is really around um, some of the big contracts we have, especially in the transportation sector when you're looking at five-year contracts to provide much mobility service or some of these where you may have a place that has a very diverse workforce but maybe isn't registered as an MCA or VBE or, you know, but just by the sheer scale of the contract, it skews everything. So how are we going to factor some of that in and what's the, you know, is there a better way to do it than what we're doing now? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, um, we have been exploring different ways to look at some of those contracts. Um, one of the ways that we have um, uh, tried and, and, and have started to implement are um, small business inclusion plans. Mm -hmm. So um, really not forcing, letting those experts come up with a plan of how they're going to incorporate. You tell us how you're going to incorporate small business in this, uh, in this contract. Um, and some of the other large contracts, um, we're looking at those strategies of planning ahead to see if there's ways to break out portions of those larger contracts so that it makes it more uh, conducive to small business participation. If I, I do understand that part. I, I think a good example is Metro Mobility. So there's three primary Metro Mobility contracts and they're extended, they're five years for a couple of reasons. Um, one is cost, but also and you have a consistent providers for the different regions for longer periods of time um, because it's, it's, and they are harder to break up. Um, you know, but then do you work with them to make sure that they have a small business program and things like that? Or, you know, are there different strategies for some of those? Because some of, you know, really not only in the best interest of the council, but the best interest for our, our uh, riders for, for Metro Mobility. Sometimes it's good to have some stability. So like, I know it's a problem that we've wrestled with how to do it. It's harder to break those sort of things into smaller contracts. And so I just know it's a question I'll keep coming up. But, so. Yes, it's um, actually, it, it wasn't specific Metro Mobility contracts. Mm -hmm. It was other uh, transit operations contracts that we actually piloted the small business inclusion plan requirement on. Um, I'm not sure when the next Metro Mobility contract is coming up. Um, I, um, um, but we have had those discussions with uh, MTS. Um, so that's where we actually piloted that, say, hey, um, you have this transit operations contract. How can you incorporate small business participation in this work, um, whether it be in uh, advertising um, um, when we have you know parts of those contracts that you're doing scheduling or or, or different different aspects 
but mainly um, trying to put the onus upon them to tell us what makes sense because as you mentioned it it's hard to break them up and hard to like set a goal on it yeah. um, so that that's one of the Additional. So who is them? Is it is them the, the contract or is them MTS in that particular? Sorry, I want to make sure I got it. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. The, the them is the contract. Okay, yeah. Because I, I, I'm sure, I think there's great opportunity with some of our contractors. Um, you know, like you said, um, they, they both have diverse um, workforce but diverse leadership in some instances as well. So it's it's... And I think they've tried to figure out too how best to do some of this. And if we're getting working with them to and build in um, some of the practices we've learned with small businesses and how to break up some of the things, right? To to get um, a broader variety of businesses. Um, I think that's actually really good because I, I just know it's a complicated question that comes up every time we go through those contract cycles. For sure, Madam. Oh, Madam, go ahead. Madam yeah. Chair. Also, I think. Um, the the other uh, component of this is we've got to develop a plan to build capacity in this in that sector for um, diverse businesses to be able to compete um, with some of these larger um, national uh, transit operation uh, firms as well. Uh, for Cedarburg and then Pacheco. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking at your question a little bit different way as well, is on some of the data that we saw before, um, how do we, um, measuring your outcomes, how do we move more MCA businesses into the larger contracts, not even part of like a five-year metro transit contract, but you know, how do we get them more into the 100,000, 200,000 million, $2 million dollar $5 million contracts, it seems like they're getting, a lot of the M cubs are the smaller purchases and are parts of bigger purchases. And are we, I know you want to increase the participation. Are you going to actually try and set some goals that, you know, kind of a wish list goal that may or may not be met, but at least it's a goal. And I think that gets to your point about how do we help build capacity for these companies to start being able to compete for these larger contracts because that's, from what I'm looking at, that's where we'd really like to see this. I'd like to see this go as to where, you know, there's many more of these MCO businesses getting larger contracts on a more consistent basis and then and, and working that way as well. Madam Chair, Council Member, um, yes, so one of the measures that I mentioned was um, the increase in the number of awarded prime contracts. Um, so that's really a true measure of, you know, capacity building, mm -hmm. able to take on bigger contracts. Um, and the other component of that is breaking out very large contracts um, and breaking them into 200,000 or more. Um, one of the really um, uh, informative outreach things that we did is we invited a who we, we do deem as a successful uh, MCUB business um, who had before, 2019 had zero dollars uh, working with the council and now has had over $2 million of work. But uh, this gentleman also uh, identified some of the challenges. And one of those challenges is uh, exactly pertinent to your question of when they are submitting bids to prime con to these larger contractors, they're often told, well, we just want you to do this this little piece. We don't we don't need you to do all all that. And they're like, well, no, I do. I don't want to just do uh, flagging or, or this. I do this work. So that is that is a challenge. And unless we can create opportunities where they're the prime contractor, I think that's where we make the the most headway. And I think that's why that's one of the key measures uh, for that. Just to follow, can you could you increase the participation percent and maybe force a hand on some of these large contractors to say, well, you can do this, so now we're going to have to. So that's an opportunity as well, 16%, 9%. I, I think if, you know, build it, you know, find a way, maybe, maybe they'll find a way to make it work and give more business to some of these as well. I'm just saying that if we're, everybody's meeting the percentages now, then keep raising that percentage up a bit more every year to see 
see what happens. It's just a thought. Madam Chair, Council Member, it, it, it definitely is um, something that you always have to consider. Um, uh, you don't want uh, it to be too easy. I mean, well, I mean, if, if we are able to easily meet a certain level, then I think it's only logical to say, can we, can we get even more? Can we go high, uh, higher in this area? Thank you, Council Member Pacheco. Yes, uh, Shanti, why don't you speak to the uh, review you're having done now or the uh, study of, of, your, of the work that you're doing and with, uh, how you compare to your peers and the like. Uh, this is the first time you went outside. Do you want to speak to that so it be more work? Yes, Madam Chair, Council Member. Um, we actually have two. Well, one that's ongoing in terms of uh, we have contracted with a third party to uh, establish our methodology uh, for our DBE triennial goal. And historically, we have done that in-house with our own staff. And um, in my experience, when you do it in-house, you're using that basic, simple uh, methodology that's prescribed in the regulations, and uh, you're really counting what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is an opportunity for us to um, be a little bit more bolder um, and, and kind of challenge ourselves um, to have a third party look at this, an independent um, uh, group to do that methodology, and to incorporate other factors into the process to where, okay, if you were, if you met council, if you did more of this, um, or you're not doing this, if you could be, you, you could achieve a higher, higher goal. So that is um, uh, ongoing right now with the University of Minnesota um, and uh, Dr. Meyer's team is, is helping us with that. Um, we also um, just uh, closed uh, an advertisement for um, a independent look at our small business contracting. Um, so our, our administration and operation of our small business programs, the D uh, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise and our MCA uh, Metropolitan Council Underutilized Business Programs, um, as well as um, our uh, small business contracting efforts um, uh, in our procurement processes, uh, best practices, and that'll include recommendations for um, improvements as well. Um, so we don't have a vendor selected um, as, uh, as of yet. They're going through that uh, panel, selection panel process. Um, so those will be two things that hopefully will be very informative uh, for us. Go ahead. I just want to brought it up because uh, I think the, the Equity Advisory Committee really liked the report itself. Uh, Shanti will be attending our meetings uh, on a regular basis. Great. The members there are excited about now looking into policies, and we've been struggling with the policies, <coughs> I guess, for I don't know, before I was here. Yeah. So uh, I think that this is uh, this is the right direction. I did look at the RFP uh, to the one study, and I thought it asked a lot of the questions that we would have asked. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to see the results there as well. Yeah, very exciting. And again, um, we've—I think you've taken this in your team and everybody across the council. But you know, this is sometimes like pushing rope uphill. I get it. Um, but the fact that you're also bringing in somebody to check our homework or that outside experience to come alongside them to just shake it up a bit in a good way, I think, is really great. Um, and I, the whole policy as it comes forward, I'll be very excited to see it. Hope, hoping too that, you know, and of course it aligns with the budget time that we're going through, but it help, I think it just helps everybody get ahead of the game rather than trying to chase it as they're under pressure to get the contracts out and figure it all out, if, if that's kind of the big picture here. Council Member Pacheco. You know, what, what I've seen and probably most of you have seen that when we come to these presentations, and whether it's investment or, or others, there's always an opportunity where we can uh, interject what we're trying to achieve with equity in our, in our work. And there was an example of that the other day, I think I mentioned it before, where uh, Council Member Wolf uh, presented the, um, the, uh, the line from your house to the sewer and what's, how they're gonna be cleaning them up and where we're going with that. And the question was from our advisory is, well, how many MCUB or how many uh, diverse businesses have you contracted to do that are, is a plan for? Uh, and uh, that's something we have, but 
But if they weren't in the same meeting, I don't know that that would have been raised. Uh, and similarly, I was at a meeting with um, the uh, the Green Line extension. I was get these colors mixed up. I need a rainbow book. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, I'll translate. Yeah. We're going to run out of colors. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but we had a report, and we got a quarter report on the hiring. Um, uh, and but it's a good report. But again, it's just one small part of each one. And as as we're looking at how we achieve these measurements, where you you can see it one report. And, and I often refer to the, the report we did on climate. Um, I thought the way that it was laid out when it was presented here, it showed how this climate could be spread, that what we're doing spread across all of the different business units that we have. And that's where uh, that's where equity needs to be. Yes. And, and so, anyway. Yeah. And to that point, when we did the exercise earlier of kind of uh, revamping our strategic plan to send to the governor's office and equity sat in its own bucket and it sat in its own bucket four years ago and I don't know before that but that's where our group was pushing back but we were kind of under the gun like this should be spread across the whole thing it shouldn't be you know and we were trying to imagine some things that we could put into community development or environment or parks or whatever um, and so yes I hope the next time we do that, but certainly just in general, as we operate, we are not thinking about it in a silo. It just shouldn't be. So, and and, and I don't know if any of you have taken the um, the um, the survey that Cole has put out lately, but it talks about the goals that are coming through the process, which was fascinating. That survey, and there's you know equity is a thing. It's you know environment sustainability, and I think well those things also could be weaved throughout everything. Um, and so I just. Appreciate that you know you're you're leading the charge, Councilmember Lilligren, and then Barbara. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks. And this is slightly leaving the agenda item, but to this discussion that we're having, and you know, as folks know, we're trying to establish, we're working to establish the 2050 design guidelines for the uh, for comprehensive planning, and this is the conversation we're having there as well. And mm -hmm. so, at least our sort of fundamental founding, plan, you know, uh, uh, planning document. We're going to we're working to figure out how to. Uh, include equity, you know, and uh, environmental justice would be another one throughout that document, and so then that would support, you know, uh, uh, shifting that focus in every area that we're working in. So yeah, great. So we're trying to figure it out, huh? Yeah, we will. There's a will, there's a way, and there's definitely a will and a way. So and comes and, from and just agree with all that. I've argued this for years that you take things like equity and climate and put them by themselves. They stay by themselves. Yes. And um, it needs to be woven in between things. And, you know, during my times on council here, it swung back and forth. Even when some of you came on board, it was, no, it has to be a pillar. Well, it's great as a pillar, but it has to be it's kind of woven in because otherwise it's too easy to take and push that pillar aside and not pay attention to it. And so the more we kind of embed it in our work every day and really start looking at it holistically, like you talk about the green line thing, we have workforce goals. So there's workforce goals, but then we also have the DBE program, the main cup program, and, and we often hear about them in different circumstances, but we don't always hear about it kind of holistically of all the, both the good that we're doing, but also we're helping them yeah, guide us where we need to improve. Too. And actually, I was working with George a few months ago to try to get that very thing before this body so that we could get kind of, I don't want to overuse the word dashboard because I've said it too many times in my lifetime and I'm doing it in my other job. But I mean, just that, that, that you know, place where it could all come together in some kind of high level, but drilled down enough that we can see the big picture because we'll have to, t you know, the thing is, this, this is really great work, and I don't know what all the other organizations are doing out there, but I, I just hazard a guess that we're on the front edge of this stuff, or leading edge, or whatever. So, but if this group, you know, periodically, not to overwork everybody, but could just see, you know, we've done the policy, we've done, we've adopted this, we're moving in that direction, and so now what? How is it working, right? And you are in it every day, but to help us get there because. You've heard this council and council before. Whatever you need, let us know. Because we want you to feel good about the support and the resources you're getting. And when you said started, we finally have the resources to do this, that that helped me to, you know, to appreciate how hard it's been, but we want you to have the resources. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will say that um, you've never said no to me yet, so I'm gonna keep that. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, questions? 
Great work. So we'll see you again and appreciate it. And again, hats off to everybody. Share that our appreciation across the council for everybody involved in this. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we have um, uh, one last item on information, and this is going to be on labor strategy. So, um, has anyone? Would anyone? I got it. To, okay. Thank you, Councilmember Lowenbrand. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that to close this meeting under Section 13D.03, uh, <coughs> Subdivision One of the Minnesota Statute, so we can consider a labor development negotiation related to labor strategies. Thank you, Councilmember Lowenbrand. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Barber. Um, just for everybody who's watching from home, the governing body of a public employer by majority vote in a public meeting may decide to hold a closed meeting under the provisions of Section 13D.03, Subdivision 1B, under Minnesota statutes. The discussion at the meeting uh, closed under this law must be confined to labor negotiation strategies, developments, and or discussion and review of labor proposals. The proceedings of a meeting uh, closed under this law will be tape recorded, preserved for two years, and made available to the public as provided by law. Um, so with that, um, again, I just want to say, let me see what else do I want to say. Um, and we're only going to be discussing um, business on that item. And then just for the record, we're not going to be coming back into the session again. So once, once this portion of our meeting is closed, we'll be <coughs> for the day. So with that, I will declare that the, um, well, I suppose we should take a vote on that. All those in favor of closing the meeting say aye. 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 And those opposed, no. Um, the meeting is closed, and I'll mark the time at 323.